I want to start off by reading the mission of several well-known organizations and see if you recognize them. Okay, ready? Here it goes. To bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Do you have a guess? Okay, what if I just say the phrase, just do it? Now, you probably know if you didn't already, Nike. Okay, here's another one. To put Christian principles into practice through programs that build healthy spirit, mind, and body for all. You know this one? Should I start singing the song, maybe? YMCA. Okay, <laughs> no need to do that. YMCA. Okay, here's the last one. Bringing the best user experience to its customers through innovative hardware, software, and services. You have a guess? It's the company that makes the thing probably in your pocket, your phone, one of your phones, Apple. Uh, sometimes I think the mission of Apple should be making products that you need to put in a steel case because if they break, you will go broke. But what's interesting about these organizations is that they've been around for a while now, but each of them has, at one time or another, gone through a season of change and innovation. They've been able to adapt to a changing culture and continue to be successful. But I would say even more important than that is that within these organizations, there is a high level of clarity around their mission. Everyone knows what their purpose is, the reason they exist. And this singular focus of mission allows them to put the maximum amount of time, talent, and resources towards that mission. But as great as these organizations are, I believe there is a global movement that is even greater. Its purpose and mission is more important. The risks are worth taking. The challenges are worth enduring. And that movement is the church. But what is the mission of the church? In part one of this series, we said the church was established by Jesus, and it's under the rule and reign of Jesus and gets its power from Jesus. Matthew, the gospel writer, and one of Jesus' closest followers records an encounter that Jesus has with another apostle, Peter. The scripture says, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church was established on the confession that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus says it's on this confession of Peter that he will build his church. Now, that's a little reminder there. It's his church. It's not mine. It's not yours, but his church, Jesus' church. Now, I think it might be helpful to talk about what the church is not. Sometimes I think we think of the church like a country club. Now, we would never say that, of course, but by our behavior, Sometimes we treat it the same way we would treat a country club. We regularly gather for activities, and instead of golf, it's religious activities. We pay our dues, and as a result, we expect certain privileges. Membership in the club is reserved only for those who are accepted into the club and by the club and pay their dues. Sometimes if someone tries to enter the club, we don't think that, that they quite fit in. We, we get uncomfortable because we don't want anything to disrupt our little group of friends that we have in the club. But the church is not a country club where we expect to receive certain privileges. Other times we think of the church maybe like a gym that we belong to. Now, I know some of us are faithful gym goers, but the truth is that most people who pay for a gym membership don't actually go. Can I confess something to you right now? I have a gym membership and I'm one of those that doesn't go very often. And if you're in that situation, what are the thoughts that you have? Thoughts like, I know I should go, but I'm just so busy. Or Sunday is my only day to sleep in, so going to the gym is just hard. Or I'm, I'm not like some of the people in that gym. They look like professionals, and I'm just a beginner. Now, just insert the word church or gym in those thoughts. I know I should go, but I'm just so busy with life. Or Sunday is my only day to sleep in, so going to church is just hard. Or I'm not like some of the people at church. They're just more spiritual than me. But friends, the church is not a gym where we pay our dues but are not an active part of it. A third way we sometimes think of the church and even treat the church is like a fan group. Now, 
I'm a huge fan of our local teams here in Atlanta, Braves, Falcons, Georgia Bulldogs. And sometimes, if I'm honest with you, my fandom can be seen as a little much. So much so that I start using the word we when talking about one of the teams I pull for. Anybody identify with that? And my wife will sometimes give me a hard time, like, we? Or are you on the team? Yes, honey, the team needs me to turn on the TV and yell and scream, and somehow my enthusiasm goes through the TV and onto the field and helps them win. Who doesn't know that? But as much as I would like to think that I'm part of the team, I'm really not part of the team. But the church is not just a fan group. We're not called to just sit in the stands and watch. We are called to get in the game. So if it's not a country club or a gym or a fan group, what is the church? Well, the Apostle Peter, again, makes a clear statement about the church in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, but you, talking about to you, you and I, the church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The church is not a club, but it's the people of God. Now, Peter uses four different names for us, the church, and he's not referring just to individuals. He's referring to the church collectively. He says it's a chosen people, a royal priesthood, holy nation, and God's special possession. And those four terms each have specific meanings, but the overall point is that the church is the people of God set apart. You are set apart. You collectively as Christ followers, we as Christ followers are set apart. You are not like the others. You are special. You're not the generic brand, but you are the premium brand. And don't tell me the generic brand is just like the premium brand, okay? You better not show up to my house with great value cola or generic ketchup. I want the real Coca-Cola and I want the real Heinz ketchup, okay? There is a big difference. See, your life and my life is set apart. We are distinct so that we are to live for God. The Apostle Paul urges Christ's followers to, to do this. He says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the, to God the Father through him. The church is the people of God set apart to glorify God. We are here to worship God with our whole life, every single area of our life. But there's a second part of who we are. Let's go back to the second half of the verse from 1 Peter in which he says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Peter says that we are the people of God set apart to glorify God for a purpose. What is that purpose? It is to declare his praises. Now, you might think, oh, he wants us just to get together and maybe sing songs, and that's what we're supposed to do. Well, that's one piece of what we do. What Peter is talking about here is evangelism. We are called to be the people of God who tell the story of Jesus. Telling the story of Jesus, that's evangelism. And the him who Peter says called us out of darkness into his light is Jesus. And our purpose as the church is twofold. One, it's to glorify God with our whole life, as I said. And two, it's to tell the story of Jesus. So we have worship and mission. When we tell the story of Jesus, we capture people's hearts because that's what stories do. They capture their hearts. They move people. And the story of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, and ultimately his ascension is the best news that anyone can hear because it's news that changes people forever. I want you to think about your story for a moment. You may think, well, my story is not that impressive or dramatic. You may think that uh, maybe your story doesn't matter, but I want you to know today that your story matters because you matter. And what Jesus has done in your life is the story that's going to make a difference in someone else's life and become part of their story. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is the mission of the church given by Jesus himself. And he says this to us. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The mission of the church is to make disciples who make disciples. 
Ben Bauman said this, what if we quit thinking about tax write-offs or keeping institutions alive or church buildings full or denominations going and focus on how to make the story of Jesus the best news in people's lives? I love that. How do we make the story of Jesus the best news in people's lives? So our purpose is twofold, worship and mission. But unfortunately, in the history of the church, it seems that sometimes we've had a little trouble with this oscillating to one extreme or the other. In its effort to be a holy people, sometimes the church has gone to the worship extreme and withdrawn from the world. We might call this a holy huddle. And the result of this extreme is a neglect of the mission. On the other end, sometimes the church has overemphasized mission and unintentionally neglected worship. And what happens here is that we assimilate the views and values of culture and even conform to them. And in doing so, we neglect worship. I want you to think of it like this. Uh, Right here, I have a a balance scale. And and each side of a scale can be weighed down, of course. But uh, for there to be balance, there has to be equal weight or equal force applied to each side. So a little science lesson here for you. You're welcome. Okay, so think of it like this. Think of uh, if we had one side is, is worship, and that's the side that, that we're talking about of, of living set apart as the, as the people of God, living for God with our whole lives. And, and think of the other side as mission. And on the mission side, we, you know, we're engaging in the mission of the church, which is to make disciples who make disciples. So uh, I've got some marbles in my pocket, and and what happens is when I put a marble on one side, it, it weighs it down. And when I put a marble on the worship side, for example, what happens? It goes down and it, it becomes uneven. You see, when the church puts an overemphasis on worship, it neglects the mission. Now, how does this happen? Well, when we become unaware of the needs of the people around us, or if we look around and there's no one new in our church recently, or maybe we're uncomfortable when people come into our church and community and change the dynamics of it. So we need to pursue balance. So to do that, I need to take a few marbles and and put them on the mission side over here. Now, notice, you know, I I don't need to take the marbles out of the worship side. In fact, I leave the marbles on the worship side, and that's important because in our effort to accomplish the mission of making disciples, we cannot sacrifice our identity as the set-apart people of God. So instead of taking marbles from one side to the other, I just add them to each side. And what do I have now? I have balance. Friends, we must passionately pursue a balance of faithfully being the people of God and living on mission for God in the world. And let me tell you, this is not always easy. In fact, there's going to be tension. There will be times when we realize we're too heavy on the worship side and And maybe we need to put a little more weight or emphasis on the mission side. We'll do things to reach new people and help them find Jesus. There'll be other times when we are maybe leaning too heavy on the mission side. We'll realize that, you know, there are a lot of new people here that that need to be discipled into what it means to live a life for God. So we'll spend a season adding more weight and creating more balance and helping people grow and be discipled. But in the end, I want to say this, we don't exist for ourselves. Let me say it again. We don't exist for ourselves. The church, we exist for those who are not here yet. Diedrich Bonhoeffer has one of my favorite quotes ever. He says that the church is the church only when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. So what does this mean for Legacy Church? If you're watching online or in person, what does it mean for those of us who call Legacy our church home? I want to suggest three values that we live by individually, but more importantly, as a collective body, because our individual aims are best lived out in the context of community. And the first is that we passionately pursue intimacy with God. We must be people who are faithful to the word of God and seek to immerse ourselves in the word and in prayer. We are in a day where the forces of darkness can so easily tear us down. The enemy wants nothing more than to disrupt your life, your marriage, 
your children, and so on. And we will only be the people of God set apart by faithfulness to his word and prayer. If you're part of Legacy Church, I want to ask you to commit to passionately pursuing intimacy with God in two ways. First, in the word and prayer daily, and second, by gathering weekly with your church family. The second value I want to encourage you to embrace is that there is a place for everyone here, and everyone has a place. Every person that is part of this community is needed to accomplish the mission. Let me say it again. Every person, every single one of you watching that is part of this community is needed to accomplish the mission. The church is not a country club or gym or fan group. You are needed and God has gifted you to help move things forward. There are a lot of people that are part of Legacy that serve in some capacity and that is what makes this church great. But there are still a number of you who have yet to join a team and I want to encourage you today even challenge you to not sit in the stands and watch, but get in the game. The two ways that you can do that is one, to explore your gifts. What are the gifts that God has given you? And second, to try a team, test drive a team. What you do to serve matters. Now, several years ago, we had a guy come to the church that we were at at the time. And a few months later, I asked him, what was it that made you come back? And and become part of our church. He says, you know what he said? It wasn't the music, it wasn't the preaching, or even the coffee, I know, surprising. But he said the day of his first visit happened to be raining, and one of our volunteers noticed him getting out of his car in the rain without an umbrella. So the volunteer then ran out to the car with an umbrella and helped the guy get inside the building without getting soaked. And immediately he felt like people cared about him. That's why I say there's no small job in the church. Everything is important from the street to the seat. In fact, if you're not currently serving, I want you to go right now to lcga.info and click the link to begin the conversation. Don't worry, you're not signing up for a lifetime commitment. We want to help you figure out how to get involved. And I want to tell you, this is not going to be a place where you can just sit and watch. In fact, I want to make it somewhat impossible for someone to not get involved here. So go to lcga.info and let's start that conversation. The third value I'm asking you to embrace is that every person matters to God, so they matter to us. There is not a single person on the face of the earth that God does not love deeply, and there's not a single person that is too far from God. Every person matters. The single parent struggling to make ends meet matters. The addict who feels alone matters. The young family matters. The widow matters. The man angry at God matters. The woman abused matters. The person burnt by the church matters. Every person matters. And because every person matters, we must do everything it takes to reach them. And one day I hope that we can look around the room and we're shocked by who's here. And we can't help but say, only God. Only God could do that in their life. Only God could save them. Only God could turn them around. Friends, this is our mission, and it is the most important mission in the world. I'm just getting amped up right now talking about it. But sometimes it can seem a bit daunting, though. If we're honest, there are so many people that need to hear the story of Jesus. There are so many who are far from God. There are so many who are angry at God and adverse to church. What can we do? But friends, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage us collectively. It is not totally up to us. The last part of the mission Jesus gives us in Matthew 28, we sometimes forget when he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the mission is carried out by us, but the success of the mission is not up to us. It is up to the Spirit. We go with the power of the Spirit to accomplish the mission. Pastor and author Kevin DeYoung says this, there can only be a mission imperative because there is first this glorious indicative. God does not send out his church to conquer. He sends us out in the name of the one who has already conquered. We go only because he reigns. We are on mission for a king that has already won the battle. And I believe this mission is worth giving your life to. It's the only mission in the world that has eternity at stake. So what about you? 
What is the church? The church is the people of God given the spirit of God to accomplish the mission of God. We are the church. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are the church. We are your church, the body of Christ, given the spirit of God to accomplish the mission of God. That is who we are. And God, I pray that every person watching this today feels empowered to carry out the mission, feels encouraged to live a life completely and totally given to you, and to be part of the mission that you've given all of us to make disciples who make disciples. God, thank you for the reminder that we exist for those who are not yet here, and that this mission is worth giving our life to. So God, give us the courage, give us the faith, give us the boldness to be the kind of church that this world desperately needs. Starting right here in our community, right here maybe in our neighborhood, right here in our family, and then spreading to the ends of the earth. God, we want to be that kind of church. We ask for your help in doing that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.